<laughs> hey guys, welcome to the rollout. I'm Lindsay Rousseau. And I'm Genevieve Marie. Hello and welcome. And you are watching the Fabled 42 Network, where we create community through friendship, gaming, and chaos. Big shout out to our sponsors, Griffin Co., who does all of our 3D printed tabletop terrain and critical dice. So if you stay tuned for Realms of Vukador, we will be doing a critical dice giveaway. And we've got a fun giveaway for you after this show, too. So stay tuned for that. Um, all right, let's dive into the news real quick. Yes. All right. So Roll20 has now opened up their mobile campaign app to beta testing for pro users. The goal of the app is to be a second screen during your virtual tabletop gaming experience. So it's not going to have all the bells and whistles that the um, uh, web browser Roll20 is going to have, but the app will manage your character sheet uh, character sheet and make dice rolls for you. Uh, the app will be available for all smart devices such as Android and iOS. Nice. Um, speaking of beta, Magic the Gathering Legends has now released their open beta, which is free for consoles and P uh, PC. Uh, so Perfect World Entertainment and Cryptic Studios, uh, this is the first time they've released the beta. And it's basically, this is an action RPG version of Magic the Gathering. And so they're kind of bringing in cool, fun digital gameplay, but also exploring the lore of of the card game of Magic the Gathering, um, but you get to take control of your own planeswalker and there's a lot of really cool, powerful mages. Uh, so you get to choose from one of five classes of planeswalkers. So if you are big into Magic the Gathering, please check out the beta now. All right, well, speaking of storytelling, that is the reason we are all here today. Uh, so we have two amazing guests for you guys. We have John Zerplatten and Susan Lee joining us today. Thank you guys for being here. Um, why don't you introduce yourselves real quick? Susan, uh, let's start with you. Um, I'm Susan Lee. I'm a writer, director, artist. I'm also the founder of a very popular panel at conventions called Win uh, Women on the Dark Side. And yes, you, Genevieve's been on it before. I love it. I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah. And um, we're hoping to move that into more of an online uh, podcast sort of thing. So, and I just moved to New Orleans. So I'm getting my feet wet here and working on some new projects. Nice. And John. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I had a background in uh, traditional media. Um, and then segued into doing video games. So over the course of my career, I've written about 80 video games, uh, including things like Chronicles of Riddick, uh, Jurassic World, uh, Justice League, Ghostbusters, you know, kind of some really big brands and properties over the years. Uh, probably my biggest flex of late uh, would be, I was one of the original people at Niantic who created Ingress and then Pokemon Go, which fundamentally changed the world a few years oh, back. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, uh, so, and, <laughs> and uh, that was an amazing experience to, to be there during the insanity. Um, <laughs> and uh, currently I have a, I'll have a comic book coming out in October that I can't really talk about details on, but it, it'll, it'll release in October. It's an original property that I've created. And I've got uh, some other big video games that we'll announce in the next few months. Um, so I'm trying to keep myself busy. That's me. I'm going to squarely put the fault of Pokemon Go to the polls on you, John. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is, yeah. that, that came from you. Yeah, I, that was, that was pretty cringe when it happened. But, but, you know, the thing that's, the thing that was really fun uh, about Pokemon Go and, it was all built on top of a game called Ingress, which, which I was heavily involved with for five and a half years, was that it was both, a, well, it was a number of things, but it was both a societal shift, it was a gaming shift, it was a financial shift. Um, it did so many things culturally that I think were really interesting and significant, but probably most importantly, it moved a lot of where the game space was from VR to AR. And, mm -hmm, right. and for me, that yeah. was super exciting. I'm not an either or type person. I like all, all platforms and I of virtual reality, but I yeah. the I mix reality game for exciting thing to be a part of. Nice. Right. Well I obviously remember, yeah. I was just gonna say I remember yeah. my coworkers because I work 
I work at a large facility. My coworkers would be running around during work hours trying to get, yes, <laughs> trying to capture their Pokemon. <laughs> well, and then yeah, Comic-Con, what was it? Comic-Con four years ago? Like they yeah. set up Hall H as Pokemon Go Center because so many people at the convention, it was literally a last minute thing. They're like, okay, everyone playing Pokemon Go, go to Hall H. <laughs> while there are we the Nyan oh no you froze John bit of a glitch bit okay. of a glitch <laughs> no it's not just you it's him um okay so obviously you know we'll get back to Pokemon Go I'm sure um <laughs> yeah there he's back hello yeah you're still here I'm just saying just I'm just saying we had this thing called the Niantic Hunch which is people would look at their phones like this and they're walking around <laughs> and so we knew they were playing Pokemon Go or Ingress, yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, one of the big things here at Fable 42 is we are storytellers. You know, we tell stories through tabletop gaming, so many different ways. And you two are, you know, master storytellers. And we just thought it'd be really interesting to kind of talk about the craft of storytelling, but also in different mediums, you know, because you, we've got video games, we've got novels, we've got comic books, you know, obviously here we have tabletop gaming. And so just kind of like how that all manifests, you know, what goes into storytelling, but then also kind of sort of the uniqueness of the different um, mediums in which you story in which you can tell stories. Um, I know that's a big topic, but yep. <laughs> um <laughs> However, you want to dive in and address it. <laughs> and crack that nut. There you go. Well, I, I do it in so many different ways. And it's kind of fun because I started out as a director and I, I love nothing more than directing. And it's so fun to take a script and put it in the hands, especially when you have really good actors and find a collaboration to really make the words that are on the paper come to life and build three dimensional characters and through, build a real space no matter how outrageous or silly or, or uh, you know, sort of fanciful the word is. So that's always been sort of my heart and soul is uh, either writing for plays or writing for films. Uh, I've made a million short films and uh, it's just, it's so much fun to look at somebody's words and say, think about as a director, what can I do? What can I bring to the table? that's gonna make these words vibrant and alive and not just have them be a recitation of the words, you know? Um, and I think that's the same with when I write uh, prose, I want it to be alive on the page. I don't want it to just be in, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then. And, then. Um, and it's been fun. I've translated a couple of properties of mine across multiple things. So I have a project called Wraith of Love. It started out as a screenplay, and then I adapted it to a comic book. And it was really difficult. It was kind of challenging because things that you would have four or five minutes on screen to tell might eat up eight pages of comic book. And you have to figure out, like I'm working on the second issue of the book right now. And it's all exposition, but it's really important exposition. And I'm trying to decide, is it worth the first six pages of the comic book to have that exposition? Or do I need to tighten it up? So it's all trying to figure out how to adapt things in, in different mediums right because right. with comics you're also working with space <laughs> like there's only so much that you can fit yeah. on a page right yeah and I to make two, I two people, two. go ahead Susan. i was gonna say it's meant to make two people sitting and talking interesting for six pages yeah is a challenge yeah. Yeah, for me, what I what I tend to do is if I'm adapting something that starts kind of slow, but I need it to get big fast, I look at nonlinear as a way to do it. So I will oftentimes go find a really interesting place in the story and just pull it forward and just deal with that and then, you know, rewind the story a few days earlier and, and pick it up. Because I think you, specifically for video games, you need to hook people early, you need to get them into the experience. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and you know, video, specifically with video games, video games are a lean forward medium, not a lean back medium. And yeah. so there's an expectation on the part of a player to be able to take control and get going. They wanna start the experience and they feel like the more you keep them from getting into it, the more frustrated they'll get. So what I try and do is make the story engaging and exciting and thrilling uh, to provide context for 
what the player is going to do when they're gaming, when they're when they've got control, and then get to it as quickly as possible. So, um, so you know, a scene that might be totally appropriate in a feature film or a streaming TV uh, product that could be a six or seven minute scene in video game, it, it needs to be a forty five second scene, and you need right. to figure out how to do that. So. So that's a big part of it. It's being able to kind of shorthand your storytelling, being able to get right. to the essence of it. You know, um, William Goldman had this amazing, it has an amazing concept about screenwriting that you want to enter the scene as late as you can and you want to exit it as early as you can. And so when, you, uh, when you're writing for video games, you're always thinking of that in your mind all the time. Like, how late can I get into the scene, get to the important elements? And then how do I get out of it before maybe even it resolves itself so that the resolution can happen in gameplay? That's that's really the the essence of, of writing for video game. Right. Is it a lot of leaning on show don't tell a lot of the time, or is is yeah? Like... But even more than that, it's it's play it first. If if the if the player can actually play the play the interaction and basically have the story be something that they're in control of, that's best. Right. And after like that, the... you show. Then if you can't, you tell. Um, right. So like but yeah, that's a, that's one hundred percent accurate. Like the opening of um, the first Tomb Raider reboot game, where you know you're running through a cave, like all mm -hmm. the stuff starts to compile on itself. Like the boat sinks, you're in a cave, you're running through a cave, right. you kick right. some. It's all exposition, but you are also mashing buttons at the same time. Right? So yeah. There, more. You know, when I started in the games business, we would have these tutorial introduction sections, which would be mm -hmm. somebody in a warehouse pushing things around push objects and jump on things and all of that. But now we tend to tutorial on the fly. So what you want to do is get into the action and then we'll tell you when you get to the river how to cross it and then you play it, right? Rather than starting in some place that's uninteresting. Um, right. And you do this for a number of reasons and it's, it's not just for the players, but uh, still to this day, there is value in somebody going to a Best Buy or a Target and playing the first three to five to 10 minutes of your game. And so you want yeah. those to be as exciting and thrilling as possible. The streaming content, a lot of people will, you know, download, download something to their device, to their console, and they'll give it 10 minutes. And if they're not excited and thrilled after 10 minutes, you've lost yeah. them. So, so you're constantly thinking of ways to hook them early. Right. Yeah. Susan, um, with, with comic book writing, again, like, you said that you didn't want to like just have a huge uh, bleh, exposition <laughs> dump on people like right in the first six pages because yeah. I mean especially volumes of comic books if you're not if you're not doing like a compiled like volume where it is actually like a big book if it's more like the magazine style then right. pages is a lot. Uh, it is. It, how, it is. I was just gonna ask how do you tinker like what mechanics do you use to tinker to cut that down or or maybe like self-edit well i was i was uh taught how to make comic books by a wonderful storyteller by jeff johnson and uh he always was talking about again it, it still comes to show don't tell you want to make sure that what you're seeing on the page leads the story forward even if it is two people sitting and talking so he showed me how to do thumbnails and then rough layouts and then your final layout. So I play around a lot in my roughs and just go, hmm, I have a lot of dialogue here. Is it worth jamming all that dialogue into you know, this big of a panel? Or is it something that I could cut a hunk of that dialogue out, sum it up in a better way? Um, it's Again, if it were on screen, we could have this great conversation about things, but on paper, you don't want to read a whole lot of stuff unless it's really, really important. So in these six pages, I've been doing a lot of, uh, I've actually drew the first six pages and then threw them out and started all over again mm -hmm. because I didn't like the way they were going. And um, so I just find I'm thumbnailing a lot and then putting it into the rough layout, seeing if it works and if it doesn't work, then go back to thumbnailing and being willing to cut, like just being willing to go, that doesn't work. What do I need to do to make it work? Right. Most of the time, the most interesting characters are the ones that say like one word. And you're like, oh, that's yeah. interesting. That yeah. makes them. And mysterious. you can do it with a look or a image. Yeah, or like a the like close up on the eyes or something. The yeah. only the only comic book, and I'm it's it's actually a manga that I can say 
has been fine with just dumping dialogue on you and exposition is Death Note. That's the only one that I have ever been able to say can do tons of dialogue works for the story. Yeah, and I tend to go back yeah. to, I have um, the series of Fatal by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. And that's a little more my genre. I don't do superheroes. I don't do big flashy you know, characters. Um, it's right. much more noir based. So when I get stuck and I'm not sure what to do, the first thing I do is I'll go over and I'll pull out those books and I'll flip through those books and see how they handled it. Or I'll go to the Marvel Noir comics because those are much more in the genre what I'm doing. So I can flip through them and go, how did they handle this? How did they condense it? How did they, could I do it as a flashback? Like, how yeah. did they do it in a way that's interesting? What right. I, so, what I try and do too, is I always like my exposition scenes to be happening in motion. So rather than two people sitting at a diner at a chair and you know sitting in chairs, I'll put them in a car. I'll put them in a helicopter. I'll have them running down the street from something. You know, I want I want the I want the scenes where like I there's story that I need to get out. I still want the scenes to be happening in a way that there's a tension, there's a dramatic tension in place mm -hmm. uh, that's happening on top of that scene. Um, yeah, and that's really thing that you can see in a lot of uh, writers that I really admire. Like if you go back and watch even uh, Tarantino's scenes where he's got people sitting around chairs, there's some underlying bit that the audience knows before that sequence takes place that is creating a tension and is creating sort of dramatic drive to that scene. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I'm always looking for ways to do that. Um, and in the in this graph novel that I have coming out, um, it was a challenge because two time paces, two different places in time. And I have uh, I have two basic point of views kind of in juxtaposition with one another across 400 years. And so it was a challenge, but I, I really, I was really excited about, you know, trying to accept that challenge and make it work. And ultimately we get boiled down to, yeah, how do I get these characters constantly moving? And then yeah. they can tell the, and then they can talk about all kinds of stuff. But I want to have some drive happening in that scene. I feel like yeah. that's like the Air, the Aaron Sorkin trick of just like walking <laughs> shots, walking and talking. Like the West Wing, exactly. it's nothing but like walking down hallways and talking. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's so you, much more dramatic. At, yeah. Right. And if you look at a lot of feature films, what they'll do is they'll they'll have the two characters talking, the crowd at the bar, they'll be in a nightclub, there'll be someplace where there's mm -hmm. motion. So yeah. there's always something, there's a, dynas, a dynamic element to that that you want to get into the scene, even if it's a, even if it's a talkie scene that needs to get out so that people can understand what's going on in the story. Um, right. I think that's really important. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. John, you have, a, you have an interesting, oh, sorry, you wanna add something? Oh, no, that? I was just gonna say, I think what makes a lot of the Marvel movies, inter not all of them, <laughs> a lot of them interesting is that while in battle and while they're getting characters from point A to point B, they do drop in lines that actually furthers mm -hmm. the story long, yeah. along as well as character development like that yeah that to me is is a good they i call it puzzle piecing it's, it's a very good way to piece together the puzzle in order to get the action moving along but to also inform yeah. the audience what's happening yeah and they do it yeah. in such it's not like okay here we're gonna explain all this to you it's very yeah. natural organic so you don't yeah. feel like there's a character just standing there dictating to you what's going on. Right. Yeah. Like, here's who I am. Yeah. Yeah. So John, you, you have kind of an interesting take, I think, on storytelling because you've worked in both original properties that you've created yourself, but you've also mm -hmm. had to develop existing properties. So you've yes. had to write for characters that are already out there in the world. Can you explain a little bit how, you know, what goes into kind of those two, that kind of juxtaposing ways of storytelling? Yeah. I uh, oh, you no, can take a awesome. property like Jurassic World and you go, okay, mm -hmm. here's, here's a big studio <laughs> with a lot of very powerful people behind it. And they're handing you one of the crown jewels and, and your goal is not to fuck it up. You know, I mean, that's really, you're like, your whole objective is, okay, how do I do this in a way that I can honor the property, uh, you know, and hopefully bring something to it, you know, that's interesting and unique. And so 
uh, for characters that for well specifically for Jurassic World, you know, nobody's written more Ian Malcolm than I have you know, which is kind of a weird thing to say <laughs> across all of the property. But, you know, I've, I've written 150 pages of Ian Malcolm and he shows up in three or four pages in the film, the last one. So, um, so you have to kind of think the way the, the, the character has been developed, but you also kind of have to anticipate the way the act has brought that character to life. You know, Susan was talking yeah. earlier about how, how a, an actor really brings it off the page. And I always look at the work that I do as about 80%. Like I can get you 80% of the way to the finish line, but you really need that 20% from the actor to come in and bring all of their skills and abilities to it, to really pull it and, and bring it alive and make it sing and fly. So with some of these characters, I do a lot of research. Um, I watch, I'll watch the movies, I'll read the books, I'll go online and go to uh, fan groups and, and study and, and learn as much as I can about that character. And I also do try and research uh, interviews that the actor may have done if I'm working with an actor like, you know, Jeff Goldblum for, for Ian Malcolm. And then, and then once I've done that, I start the process of trying to write it as if I can hear them in my head. So I, I want the dialogue to feel like, would that be something they would say? And if so, can I hear them performing it in my head? And if I can, mm. I kind of know I'm in the right direction. And, uh, and then what I tend to do is the first draft, I tend to write it as if I hear the actor actually doing the performance. But when we take it to the recording studio, I go back and I take all of that out. So um, I don't want to tell Jeff Goldblum where to pause, where to repeat a word, where to put an ellipses, where to put an ah, uh, an um. You know, life uh, finds a way. That's his choice. That's not my choice, right? So it's just going to be life finds a way in the script. And he'll decide where he wants to put the pause if he wants to put one. Um, and, then, and then that sort of goes through the process of excising. But I know that I have the words right. I know that I have the essence of the dialogue correct, and then turn it over to the performer and see where they take it. Um, yeah. And so that's that's kind of the fun, exciting part of, of creating in people's properties that exist, is that you kind of have something to start with. You know, you can mm -hmm. kind of go back and go, okay, I have plenty of elements here I can look at and kind of go, okay, yeah. uh, here's a starting point I can work on. Um, and then it's just a trick from each for each character. Um, but like in the past few years, I've written like, you know, Ray stands for Ghostbusters, right? So you're, you're writing comedy for Dan Aykroyd. How crazy is that? You know, I wish I could go back and pitch my, uh, my, my 18 year old self and tell him that, you know, that guy that you admired on Saturday Night Live one day, you writing, you know, dialogue for him and writing right. jokes for him and he'd be able to pull them off and perform them and actually tell you you liked him. So, so yeah. that's, that's the exciting part of my job. So I know like as actors, you know, we tend to have touchstones that get us like either dialect touchstones or character touchstones that kind of, you know, get us into what, especially in voiceover, if you're doing a multiple, lots of different characters that get you into that character. Mm -hmm. Do you have that sort of similar thing for when you're writing? Do you have like a, a go-to touchstone kind of line or something that? Yeah, I mean, I... I tend to, like my British actors all tend to end sentences with then, you know, cause I can go, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna go and do my bad phony version of what English people sound like to me, you know, and I can start that process of writing it um, so that it, it kind of gets into the rhythm of, of that vibe, that sensibility. But then, yeah, but then again, when I get into the recording studio, a lot of times I go back and go, okay, that's just embarrassing. Let's get that out of there. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> But yeah, there's there's certain characters that I think you start with as sort of foundational characters that you build on over and over again. I sort of have my archetype characters that I can always turn to. And, and on top of that, um, I'm sure Susan is the same way, but if you're a writer, you have to be a really good observer. And so yeah. everywhere I go, I'm paying attention to everything. And at the Starbucks and I'm hearing some interesting talk happening in front of me and people are using interesting phrases or saying an interesting name or have a really interesting way into a conversation, my ears perk up and I'm listening. And then the moment I'm back in the car, I'm dictating into my phone, everything that I just heard. Because later I'll come back and I'll find a way to work that into something that becomes a really interesting character. And there are literally hundreds of characters that I've written over the years that don't know that I was listening, you know, behind them. I was, I was eavesdropping them at the route, you know, and, and listening in on their conversation and kind of collecting. But I think that's the biggest skill set you can have as a writer is to be an, a really good observer. Yeah. If you're a really good observer and you can then record those observations in a meaningful way. That's what writing is. 
Yeah, because we want every you want every character, whether you're writing video games or whether you're writing a screenplay or whether you're writing a novel, you want every character to sound unique. You don't want your characters to all sound alike. And the more you write, the more you, and the more you listen to people, you start to hear the rhythms. If you have a character who's a 40 year old woman who's gone through a lot of stuff or you have a 20 year old guy who is, you know, not experienced a lot in life, they're going to speak very differently. And it's keeping your ears open to go, oh, that guy sounds like that character I'm writing. Or is it a regional thing? Like you said, with, like John said, with British, like, is it a regional thing? Here, there's so many Southern accents. And so the way they come at just conversation is so much different than what I hear or heard in California. Yep. So I do, I find myself here just really kind of listening to everybody because the language is so different. And I find beginning writers, what happens with all of us is all of your characters sound exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And the more that you can think about, oh, that character, maybe that speaks like my mom or like in Wraith of Love, my comic book and the, the screenplay, the sidekick is my friend, Patty. And as soon as I locked into that and went, oh, that's Patty. Then all of a sudden I could hear her in my head. I could hear the rhythm. I could hear her funny, quippy kind of character in there. So the more that you can find the reality of those characters, and kind of like Genevieve said, and I think that's what makes the Marvel film so great is it's about Tony Stark, not about Iron Man. And yeah. they create really deep three-dimensional characters you care about and who are all completely different from each other. Yeah, I just yeah. recently finished a pilot um, that we're currently taking out and the lead character is a 17 year old teenage girl right and it's about her and her friends and a lot of the people that have read it and give me feedback on it i'll say the same thing like how are you able to write these teenage girls in such a way that they actually sound like teenage girls and i said i have a teenage daughter you know <laughs> and and when her friends come over you know they think they're they think they're all having a good time enjoying each other's company and and going on TikTok and doing whatever but dad is You're listening you know and dad is saying, <laughs> And dad is paying attention to the way they talk and how they interact with each other. And, and that's really, that's really part of the skill set of being a writer is, is being able to kind of absorb that and then spew it back out in a way that works for you, that works for the characters you're creating. Um, you know, teenage girls call each other dude, you know, and that was not something that was not something I really understood or knew about. And then suddenly I hear them all talking and calling each other dude and bro. And I'm like, okay. And then, you know, you find a way to work that into the script and it, it lends an authenticity to your voice. Um, mm -hmm. I was at a I, conference, yeah, I was gonna say, I was at a conference a couple years ago and a very famous actress who I admire quite a bit and has done some amazing films and television uh, wants to get more women involved in production. And, and I, I'm totally on board with that, by the way. I love that concept as much as, as, much as a concept can be loved, but but she said at one point, she said, well, you could just go through a script and just change the names so that some of the parts are women. And I'm like, no, you can't really do that because a good writer should be writing their women differently than men. They should be writing their senior citizens differently than teenagers. They should be writing straight and gay with certain uh, uh, you know, sensitivities that you want to make sure you're including in your script. You know, you if you if you care about your characters, and I try and care about every character I write, if you really care about your characters, you wanna honor them. And the way you honor them is by giving them authentic voices that are true to who they are. And so I don't think you can just say all characters in a script are generic and just plug A and B character, actor, gender, age, whatever into it and make it work. It, you have to be willing to, to take the time to craft your dialogue and craft your characters so they're true to the they're true to the story you're creating, but they're true to the character you're creating. Because that's what we do, right? You know, Susan, I, I, the, the thing that I found mo most fun about, one of the most fun things about my job is I make people. I yeah. create people, right? Like today, this person doesn't exist and tonight they will exist and they'll be talking to me. How fun is that? But yeah. you have to be, you have to, you have to honor that and you have to be true to it and you have to respect that process. And so, yeah, I, th I think one of the big mistakes is Susan said, I think one of the big, big mistakes of, of, of writers who are just getting into it is they make the characters too generic and they don't think enough about who they really are. Yeah, and, and I, I know I've nailed it because when, when I write a screenplay or any kind of script, 
I have, a, in LA, I have a really great group of actors I trust and they're not gonna yes ma'am me. They're gonna tell me what doesn't work. And when we were working on the film for Wraith of Love, um, I had a wonderful group of people uh, that were gonna perform in it. And I thought I had written the male character. The male character is sort of the girl throughout it. He's sort of the, the one who needs to be rescued. I thought I nailed him. And then the actor who was reading that part pulled me aside after one of the readings and he was like, this has got to be, he can be sure he can be the vulnerable one and he can be the one that needs to be rescued, but men have to want to have a beer with him. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get him to that point where he doesn't have to be rough and tumble, he can still be sweet and vulnerable and charming, but right now I don't want to have a beer with him. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of rocked me back because I thought I'd written this great character and I was like, huh, now I got to figure out what do I need to, and it was just minor things. And the yeah. way he interacted with the lead character and, you know, I had sort of feminized him too much yeah. and yeah. with just tiny tweaks, but thankfully with great, you know, really good actors who get it. And I find when I nail it, I'll be listening to a script I've written. I don't remember writing half the dialogue because it comes out, it flows so naturally and it sounds so honest that I get caught up and go, whoa, that's really good. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute, I wrote that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, pretty good. that's one of the tricks is that's one of the tricks is when you do it well, you're not supposed to be noticed, right? Yeah. When you're doing, when you're doing, when you're doing it right, when good direction shouldn't be pointing a, a finger at themselves saying, hey, look at me, look what I'm directing. You know, it's supposed to just be the story. And writing is the same way. You can create a really great turn of phrase in, in a script, but if the actor shines a light on it, you kind of didn't do your job right. The, the idea is the actor flows it through their performance and you go, oh my God, wasn't that awesome? You know, a lot of times when you, when you see uh, quotes, like people do screenplay quotes on the internet and they never quote the writer. They always quote the actor or the character. And, you know, and, and early on when I'd see that, I always be like, oh man, but now I realize, look, the writer did their job. The writer did exactly what they're supposed to do. The, the, the words, felt like they were coming through the performance, not something that had been written on the page. And that's, that's when you know you've done it right. Um, so yeah. yeah, I never, I used to be bothered by it, but I'm not anymore. Well, that was the one uh, interesting thing. Like, you know, I've, I've, you know, been on set for several, especially with multicam, but you know, with multicam, it's a very collaborative, uh, you know, effort. And like the writers are there. And as yeah. you know, a lot of times it's in front of a live studio of audience. And as they're recording, like if that joke doesn't land, the writer is right there writing a new one and yep. literally giving it to the actor to do it. And they'll do that like five times until they find a joke that lands. And that's the take they keep. But it's like, like you said, it's like, you can't really always know until it comes out of the actor's mouth. Or yeah. maybe if you have an audience and you're like, oh, this was amazing on paper didn't yeah, work in performance. Exactly right. And I usually will end up either being in the studio or voice directing all the performances of the stuff that I write um, specifically for that reason. Because, you know, what looks great on the page and I tend to read all of my dialogue out loud and try and perform it because a lot of times you can write something on the page, it looks great, but then you try and say it and it doesn't work, you know, and then you try and perform it and it really doesn't work the way you intended it to. And so, um, so when I have a, a large script and I take it into the studio, I, I just tell the actor, I say, if you have any problem with anything, I'm not precious about a single word on this page. If something is not working for you, say so, and let's work through it and get it right. And especially for uh, actors who have created performances that are now known to an audience, um, uh, I want them to be sure that they're comfortable that they're doing it the way they'd want to do it. Um, so a lot of times, uh, you know, I'll be sitting there and I'll be doing the voice directing and, and I, can, I can hear it or the actor can hear it. And sometimes we'll both we'll look at each other and go, we should work on this line, right? You know, it's like I'm not quite hit it landing the way I want it to. And, uh, and that's great. It puts them at ease and makes them feel very comfortable. And uh, for a lot of people that have done, you know, iconic type characters, they know the character better than I do. They've been performing this character for 30 or 40 years sometimes. And so I can literally go, okay, how would you say it? And then, and then we'll work together and find the performance and then you know, just rewrite it on the fly and keep going. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, I still get the credits. <laughs> you know, it's, it's my script, even if they yeah. wrote a great line. So, um, but, it, but it's been helpful uh, over the years. And, and, and honestly, sometimes the greatest feeling in the world is when you know, a known actor 
uh, or somebody that you've admired over the years will, will do your performance. They will do the words on the page the way you've written them and, and then point at you and go, yeah, that's a, that was good. You know, and then you're just like, oh, it's, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Yay. So, so yeah, that, that's the process. You, you know, yeah. I just, I feel like most beginning writers get too precious about their work and, mm -hmm. and you really need to understand that you're part of a collaboration and that, you know, uh, there's, there's certain screenwriting groups where people say, well, you write for the reader. No, you're, you're not. You're not writing for a reader. You're writing a script not to be read. You're writing a script to be envisioned. You know, the script is not the end product. The script is part of a blueprint of an entire product that's still to come. And that's going to require artists, directors, performers, uh, you know, prop people, got more wardrobe people, costumers, everything. There's a whole other list of people that are going to be taking the inspiration that you've created and building on that to actually create something. And so right. a script needs to be envisioned. It needs to be something yeah. that people can, can see in their head. It needs to be something that when they do read it, they see it as something else. And, right. and, and that process is a long, a convoluted process in video games that can sometimes take three or four or five years for that to happen. So you better be damn ready for the changes because they're coming. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And the revisions, the revisions are coming. So accept it. It's part of the process. Revision right. is Yeah, that's the hardest. Yeah. The hardest part with new writers, because I do a lot of script notes and stuff like that. I worked in development for a long time. And so I'll have friends come to me and say, Can you read my script? And I'll say, Okay, do you how much do you want me to like? What do you want me to give you? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to give you general, oh, this is nice, maybe do this, or do you want notes? Because right. if you want notes. Yeah. I'm going to give you notes. Yeah, I'm going to go yeah. with a red pen. Yeah. And you better have big balls because I'm going to tell you what is wrong with your script. And I have, I've had friends hire me for their friends. And I'll go, you got to tell me because I, one friend said it ended up ending her friendship with this guy because I gave it, it was a terrible script. Oh, no. And I didn't pull back. And I was like, it's terrible. Like none of the characters <laughs> sound authentic. They all sound exactly the same. The plot makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> and he kept going, well, all my friends think it's great. I'm like, yeah, did your friends work for the people I worked for? Like I worked for yeah. some pretty heavy hitters in Hollywood. So if you want really good notes, I'm going to do that. If you want somebody to pat you on the head and go, oh, good boy, you wrote something, then go talk to your friends. But it's never going to get out of your drawer. Like, no. you know, so you've got to be willing to take it, whether it's from studio executives or whether it's from actors you trust or I've done theater for a long time and sometimes it's the creative committee that builds the, that is in the theater who come to you and go mm, that's not working you got to figure out a way to make it work you know it is it's all those pieces come together when I, I studied with Susan Strasberg she was my acting teacher and she always said like whatever you get don't you have no control over the whole film all you can control is your part so do your best yeah. and do your damnedest. And that's the best you can do. And it might not work, but as long as you know that you showed up and you did the work that you need to do, that's all you can do. And I think it applies to us as writers, even as directors. I've directed a lot of crap. <laughs> There's a couple yeah. things I don't want anybody to ever see because I went into it with a good script but I got stuck with a bad cast or I got stuck with a bad script, but a good cast and you just, you know, you just try to make the best thing you can out of it. And hopefully you get something that doesn't make you hide in shame. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you... Well, and the, and the key thing too is part of your maturity as a creative is you have to be able to separate your creations from yourself. Mm -hmm. okay? So when you, when you get, you know, vicious notes back on something you've written, you have to realize that they're responding to the content. It's not about you, it's about what you've created. And you have to be able to separate those two things in your mind. If you do, then you're never really insulted. I mean, I've gotten notes over the years that I was like, man, I could really be upset about this, but I'm not going to be, you know, because this is just, you know, you know, a 24 year old executive at a studio is talking to me about the hero's journey. Like I've never heard of it before, you know, okay. <laughs> now, I can be, I, you know, I can be offended by that, or I can say, you know what, they're just responding to what's on the page. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's the reality. And my job is to try as best as possible to fix things in a way they're going to be happy with. And, right. and that's where you're kind of reaching a level of maturity about the content <laughs> you create 
when you can say, look, this is what I've created, but if somebody's, you know, going after this, that doesn't mean they're going after me, right? Yeah. And so you have to be able to kind of, you know, separate it. Um, it sounds a little mercenary and I don't mean to make it sound that way because you are passionate about what you create and, right. and you care about it. But if you're not willing to kill your babies or have somebody tell, tell you your babies are ugly, then you're, you're just, you're not really ready to do the, to do the job. Because yeah. otherwise, you just be miserable. You know, you can go to a lot of you can go to a lot of, of, of groups where there are writers commiserating in their in their in the in the awfulness of what it feels like to be a writer and be constantly under critique and criticism and how frustrating the job is and everything else. And I just want to jump in there and say, why are you trying to do it then? Go do something that makes you happy. If 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 writing makes you miserable, don't write. You know, <laughs> you know writing should be something you enjoy. And sure, there are going to be days where the things aren't happening and, and the, the process is, is getting you down. That's true with anything. It'd be true if you were digging ditches or programming a computer. You're still going to have bad days. But in general, you should enjoy your job. You should enjoy the process of what you're doing. If you like what you're doing, then the content you're creating is going to reflect that. Yeah. And if you're miserable about what you're doing, then that content will also be reflected in your misery. And yeah. uh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's something I, I just want to tell people, it's like, you don't have to be miserable to do this job. You can enjoy yeah, the yeah. job, you know, and yeah. have fun doing it. I think um, it comes between, yeah. like, enjoying writing and enjoying it, like, doing it for yourself and then doing it as a job, as right. an actual yeah. paying job and a business. <laughs> like, you have to be skilled at a lot of things in order to make it in the industry, in order to make it as a novelist, as, as a just somebody who actually writes books and comic books as well, it's not just film and TV, that you have to have that business side mm -hmm. of yourself in order to make it. Um, yeah, even as an artist, I have to look at the business and separate the business from my oh, yeah. art. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I, all the time when they, when they show up in Los Angeles, they hear like, oh, this is exciting. I'm in the film business. I'm in the music business. I'm in the game business. And they all hear the first word, but nobody hears the second word. Second word. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah. the, the constant among all of that is business. And so, yeah, like if, if you're being paid to write something for somebody, you have a responsibility, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that means you make your deliverables. You know, I have this thing called ADOT, A-D-O-T, approved deliverables on, on time. Right. Nobody, nobody gives me credit for being a nice guy or bringing bagels on Friday or making sure the coffee machine is filled up when, when it's out of coffee. Everybody pays me for being able to deliver product they need when they need it. And it's approved product. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So usually when I go through the process of, of notes and revisions from the studios, I get very little back. Um, you know, no one says go back and but go back to premise and start over. Everyone will say, you know, oh, could we tweak this line or could we drop that line or could we move this over here? All minimal notes that don't take you know, a tremendous amount of time to deal with. And, and the reason for that is before I submitted that first draft, I wanted to make sure I was buttoned up as possible because that's how I earn my, that's how I earn my living. And yeah. so, you know, that's, that's the professional business approach to, to writing. Yeah. 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 Susan, um, I mean, because you're, you know, you're an artist, you're a novelist you have the interesting position of that when you write, like you don't necessarily have a, sometimes you don't necessarily have a studio to answer to. Like how, how do you go, but you do, I mean, there is an entire process of editing as far as like novels and, and things go. There's an entire process that you go through, like, you know, giving it to other people people to read and you know get back to you on that how how does that process go how do you how are you able to go through the you know the editing process when it's when it's just you when the onus is on you as the creator well, um and I self I've self-published everything that I have right now so um except for one piece uh when I wrote my first fiction novel uh I also have been writing for a very long time and I've been through development and I've been an editor. And so I already have a lot of critical skills that a lot of writers don't. So I know when I read something, how it is. So when I did my first novel, I didn't expect gangbusters. It was just something I wanted to get out. Um, I also have, I've done a lot of proofreading and stuff like that. And I know how important format is. Yeah. And if I 
something and all of a sudden, you know, halfway through your self-published novel, there's a, you know, a break that lands the page over here somewhere. That's distracting. I want to keep you on task. So when I wrote the first novel, I went through a couple of drafts on it. When I thought it was close to where I wanted it to publish, I sent it out to three or four beta readers, people who I trust. And they all came back with really solid, uh, not a lot of changes. Um, one of the guys is a good friend of mine, and he doesn't know anything about writing. So I love him as a beta reader because he's reading it as a reader. Right. And yeah. he sent me an email back and he's like, it's really good. You know, it all made sense. And holy crap, I'm scared of you now. So <laughs> and that's exactly the perfect what I feedback. <laughs> yeah. Friend the best mine. feedback. The best feedback. I want you to be afraid of me. Uh, but that was a really straightforward novel on my memoir. Again, it was a very straightforward memoir. Uh, I wrote about the year that I lived in China and how life-changing that was to me. And again, I sent it out to beta readers um, to make sure that everything made sense. I just don't want to go, how did you get from here to there? So I haven't used a lot of editors. Um, I got a short, uh, short story accepted into the National Novel Writing Month, the NaNoWriMo. They do an anthology every year. And a couple of years ago, I had a short story accepted. That was really frustrating because they had a different editor on every round of editing. Mm. So the yeah. first round, I got really solid. And I have an old, a personal issue of people giving me notes because of somebody who, a uh, deep personal issue. So I always have to read the notes and scream and yell and go, no way, I'm not going to do any of them. And then calm down and then really read the notes. And so I implemented as many as I thought were appropriate. And then the next round, I had a different editor and they gave me a completely different set of notes. And then the third round, there was a third editor with a completely different set of notes. Mm -hmm. And then we got to the copy edit, which is supposed to be literally periods and question marks, like making sure the grammar is right, making sure. Yeah. And then I got, again, a vastly new set of notes from them. And I talked to the other people who've done the anthology before and went, is this normal? Like this is making me insane because I'll change something based on one editor. And then the next editor will ask me to change that same thing to something else. And it's not got anything to do with whether it's right or wrong. And a lot of them, they didn't even get the voice of the character. Mm -hmm. I was writing as a 12 year old girl and they kept writing these really complicated things. I'm like, but it's a 12 year old girl in first person. Right. You wouldn't say that. Yeah. And so that really frustrating for me, but I kind of sucked it up and it was really good for me to work in that environment. Um, my new novel, which I've been writing for a couple of years, is really difficult because it combines technology and magic and religion. And it's really, really difficult. So I know as I get that into rough shape, I'm going to send one copy out to my friend who does magic to go through it and help make sure that I got the magic right. And then send it, you know, to a friend who does tech and help them have them get the tech right. And then when I'm done, I have a friend who's an editor who wants to go through it and really give me hard editing notes because I know it's going to be a real bitch of a piece because it's really, really complicated. Yeah. So it's great to have beta readers, people who will read it, give me feedback. Um, but I'm actually kind of looking forward to this bigger novel and really getting into it with someone I trust to help me build it into something that's nice and strong. Well, that brings and, up a really good be, point. Oh, really quick, Genevieve, I would add on to that, that um, you also have to have a kind of self-discipline, right? This is, this is something that is an, an essential part of being a writer is you have to have self-discipline. And you, you can go to a lot of sites and say, oh, you're supposed to write 1200 words a day, you know, uh, you know yeah. 800 words a day. I don't believe any of that bullshit. <laughs> but, what I do, but what I do believe is that you have to be a writer full time. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that today, if I'm not hitting the key, you have to define what writing means. So writing is not just about slamming away on the keyboard and seeing words show up on your computer screen. Writing is about research. It's about the thought process that goes into creating characters. It's about um, structuring things out. It's about taking notes. It's about you know hitting the internet to do things and figure things out about stuff you don't know so back to that research component. So that when you do sit down to start slamming on the keyboard, you're coming from a position of confidence. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, there's nothing worse than sitting at the keyboard and not knowing what to write, you know? And right. the easiest way to solve that problem is do the groundwork. Treat writing the same way you would treat prepping for a film, right? You've got pre-pro, then you've got production, then you've got post. 
right? You've got research, you've got writing, you've got rewriting. You have to go through that process. And if you do, you're gonna be that much more comfortable when you actually sit down to write. Anybody that tells me that they have writer's block or they're frustrated with trying to get a story out, I'm like, you haven't done the work yet. Yeah, You're trying to paint the house before you've built it. So let's take a step back and think about where do you need to be in your process? And have you, te- have you taken time to reflect, you know? A lot of times I'll be out with the family and I'll be having dinner and I'm not talking. And my family will look at me and go, oh, we know what he's doing right now. They leave me alone. They don't try and go, hey, why aren't you talking right now? They know that I'm sitting there working through a scene in my head. Yeah. And I'm literally writing it in my head so that when I get to the keyboard, it doesn't feel like I'm writing it. It feels like they're playing the scene, the scene's playing out. And my job is to capture it as quickly as possible. Exactly. Exactly. And they're basically dictating the words that I'm supposed to write. And my job is to be the stenographer that gets as much of it down as quickly as I can. That, that's part of the process of writing. So don't feel guilty if you want to be a writer and you're like, I didn't write 800 words today. Who cares? You know, yeah. this, is, yeah. this is not, you know, that's not the metric by which we decide something is, is worthy of your time. Right. But yeah. did you think about being a writer today? Did you do the writer's work that you would otherwise yeah. not have done, which is, did you research? Did you take some notes? Did you spew some ideas down? Did you think about what you want to write? That's, yeah. that's yeah. part of the process. I think like that's I've, a really, go ahead, Susan, sorry. Oh, well, I was just going to say, I've done the National Novel Writing Month every year for the last nine years. And it's, it's fun. It's a great way. To, the first novel I wrote came out of that. Uh, it's a great way to get really seriously disciplined for a month because you write 50,000 words in a month. And when I first started, I, that seemed like a daunting task. But as you go get into it, they tell you, like, if you're writing your character backstory, <coughs> excuse me, that goes into your word count. If you sat down and did a bunch of research, you're writing something in the medieval times, and you spent a couple of hours on the computer and you wrote a bunch of notes about costumes or castles or whatever, that's mm-hmm. all part of your word count. And I thought that's really important because a lot of, like you said, John, a lot of people don't think about that. If I'm sitting at a coffee shop with my feet up and I'm staring off into space, I'm listening to what my characters are doing. I'm not just goofing around. I'm, yeah, my brain is going, eh, eh, trying to work on it. And it, we do forget that the, the time when you're standing in the shower and your brain is working through the characters. It's like on this book, I've been blocked on this book. And all of a sudden, while I was driving across the country, I realized I have a character I don't know what I'm doing with. I don't know if I need to keep her in the story or if I can get rid of her. And what happens if I pull her out? So I had to sit down and write some notes about, if I pull her out, what are the dominoes that fall? If I keep her in, what is her point? And so the last couple of months, it has been me restructuring things, trying to figure out this one character. And it's a lot of, I don't have a word count per se, but I've got pages of handwritten notes and I have hours of me going, well, if I do that and I do that, does that make that? Mm -hmm. And that's what I think people don't tell writers enough, young writers enough. It's okay to not be sitting at your keyboard as long as the process is there. It's the same when I paint as an artist. I don't sit down and just manufacture something. I have to be inspired. I have to figure out what I'm doing. Um, I make these geeky watercolors. But I have to go online. I have to find the silhouettes that mean something to me. And then I have to s- decide how the colors go together and how they're going to lay out on the canvas. I have to make all those decisions before I pick up a pencil or a, or a paintbrush. I don't just go, oh, we. And when you see guys, and I keep telling artists, young artists this too, you go to a convention and you see someone like Jim Lee or Jolly or anybody who sits down and knocks out a you know, Batman drawing in 12 seconds, they've drawn that character Mm-hmm. 10,000 times. Yeah. So it's yeah. super easy. They're doing a sketch for you. They're not thinking about a story. They're just knocking out a Batman sketch. That's super easy. But if they have to lay out a page of comic book, totally different thing. You yeah. won't see that ease. There's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, I have the, well, the character lead for, for this pilot that I wrote has a very specific physical uh, trait. I would call it an anomaly, but it's, it's more of a trait. And uh, I was writing the character and I thought I had the character and it was definitely a, a character I was happy with. And then about 
two weeks into the writing process, I was pretty much almost done with the pilot. I'd gotten into a point where I was like, okay, I'm, I, I can wrap this up in the next couple of days. And uh, I was surfing the internet and I happened to be in a forum on Reddit and somebody posted a picture of this young girl on Reddit that had the exact physical anomaly that I was put in my story. And I looked at this photograph and I went, oh my God, that's her. That's my character. She's literally staring back at me from this photograph. I took the photograph, put it upside along my script and went back and started to tweak through the script. And she went from being alive to being fully alive just mm -hmm. because I now had a reference piece to work from. And uh, yeah. actually in the pitch deck we're, <laughs> we're using, she's in the pitch deck. Because oh, that's funny. everyone else, because everyone else that 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 had been touching the property, you know, I showed him. I was so excited. I literally sent the producer the photograph and said, "We found her," and he wrote me back and went, "Oh my god!" You know, because <laughs> it was literally like she had just jumped off the page into a photograph, and uh, and that happens sometimes. And you have to that, but that's part of being a writer. You have to be ready for that when it happens and embrace it. Um, it's part of the process. Yeah. Well. I can't believe we're at the end of our time. Like I have so many more questions, which I will of course be emailing you in depth in the future. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. John, we'll, we'll talk about it over coffee next time. Um, I'm but thank you. Always. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Your insights were really so helpful, obviously for anyone who is looking to be a writer, who is a writer. I love that you brought up research. Cause you know, when I was a journalist, that was like 90% of my work was research. And then the 10% was writing. Um, but we have a giveaway, of course. We do. All right. So the giveaway today is something really cool. It is a Griffin Co. gift card. So in order to enter the raffle, all you have to do is type in exclamation point stories into the chat and enter. That is the exclamation mark stories into the chat and then you are entered to win the Griffin Co. Uh, gift card. Please stay to the beginnings of the realm of Ukador in order to hear who the winner is. Yay. And of course you can see uh, Susan and John's social media on there. Please follow them on social media, see what cool things they're doing. I know John's got some announcements coming out soon. And obviously Susan, we look forward when your product comes out. Women on um, the dark side. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. Women on the dark side, please. Um, so please follow all of them. And we have a really exciting show next week. So next Wednesday is trans visibility day. And so we've got a special one shot being done for um, in place of realms of Ukador we're going to have this amazing one shot and we are going to, we're so excited. Genevieve and I are going to be talking to the creator of that game, uh, Dream Askew. So please join us back next week and we will be raising money for a trans lifeline. So until then, bye guys. Yeah. Bye guys. Thank you. Thank you.